Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us during your lunch break. Um, there's um, some food just over there if you want to get some while you join us. So I'm here with Eric from Denton's, who looks at public policy practice, and then Kieran from the European Committee on the Regions, and also a member of the Cork City Council. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about how um, public services are suffering from a lot of cyber attacks. We're looking at the scale of the problem, how it can be resolved, and kind of what it means for public confidence in governments, and democracy and our services as we go forward. So I think I'll just start a little bit by describing what I see as being the scale of the problem that we face, which is, I know part of the genesis of this panel was thinking about the WannaCry attack earlier this year and how it affected the NHS, Spanish telecoms, German rail networks. Um, and also over the years, I mean, I think about a year ago, the UK National Order Office said that the problem there was limited oversight for UK government IT departments and that the process of reporting on breaches was chaotic. Now, since then, the UK government has tried to do a little bit about this. They've launched the, the National Cyber Security um, uh, Centre with a GTHQ, which is basically described in their year of existence, which um, first year anniversary was in October. The problem was large, growing and diverse. So that's not great. They said they faced, they responded to almost 600 attacks, which they described as significant. So they faced thousands, but 600 of those were what they considered significant. So clearly, I mean, clearly we're dealing with a very, very big problem. And maybe, Kieran, you can start us off by describing from your experience within the EU, what are the, what's the challenge that local governments in particular yeah. are facing with this kind of onslaught of attacks? Yeah, well, thank you for the invite. I mean, you made your point at the start, Isha, that this is a growing and complex problem, and it actually is. And within local government, within the 95,000 um, local and regional authorities across the European Union, we're behind the game in, in terms of when it comes to combating cybercrime. We really are. Um, the last... I suppose two years ago, the European Union were talking about kind of innovation hubs and smart cities and let's grow quadruple helix and partnerships. In the last two years, it's about actually kind of collating data, um, using machine read data, creating sensors in cities, looking at transport systems, climate change. But cyber attacks is something that we haven't looked at. Um, the European Committee of the Regions, which is an opinion body to the European Commission and the European Parliament, that 80% of all EU funding comes into, ci uh, into cities and regions. Uh, and so we give opinions on different things. We have not given an opinion yet on cybercrime. Um, most, my most recent opinion was on building a European data economy uh, and all the various complexities of that. But, but as I was reading up on data provision and what I can do for cities and regions and creating smart cities and uh, I think yesterday we had the I Capital Award, the Innovation Capital Award and all the great ideas that are going on in those various cities. But cybercrime is what I call an end note. Um, like this year, Tallinn is hosting the EU presidency or e Estonia is holding the EU presidency and they've actually come up with a, an e-government document and cybercrime is like the last line, it's the last sentence. Right. So we're behind. Um, like I, I had a few things in my notes that Yes, we're doing a lot on trying to uh, improve ICT services right across the European Union, but we're, we haven't come to grips with cybercrime. I, th I think if you, if you look at the 95,000 local and regional authorities across the EU, they all have small tech kind of IT administrations. As well, yeah, let's talk about this precisely. Like, why are local governments so vulnerable? Is it because the people that are working and are in charge of ensuring that IT is up to scratch maybe don't have the training that they need? What, like, why in particular they, are these governments so they vulnerable? They don't have the training. They don't have the competence. Um, and I, I, I would argue that we need more training. We really do. And, and, not, and we need emergency response teams. Um, I think I, I made the point... Um, you, you were talking about the NHS and, NHS and kind of um, airport services being hit in the UK and other services. Um, I would say between Britain and Ireland, um, if, uh, there was a survey done of local authorities in Britain last year and 76% of them actually had been hit by a cyber attack and 25% actually were, were, were held to ransomware in terms of ha we have this data, you won't have to pay for it. Uh, and I gave the account just before we went on, there was a local authority in Ireland um, that actually was robbed of 4.3 million euros through cybercrime and a, a identity theft of their, of their chief executive. Uh, wow. and, and the money was actually sent into the Far East. Now, 
I, I don't have the, I suppose, uh, the end story to that, actually what happened, but we don't have the competencies to, to follow this through. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm one of 31 councillors in the second largest local authority in Ireland. Um, and there are other, what I call second cities right across the European Union that also have kind of similar um, issues and similar problems. So we, we need to get ahead of the game and instead of just being reactive, mm. we need to become a lot more proactive. Well, Eric, we just heard here about kind of the, the breadth of the problem, the number of uh, services that are being attacked. What does this mean though for people's confidence in the, their governments, in their services, when they hear that 76% of uh, airports and, and et cetera have been attacked at some point and sometimes you don't even hear about them right there are so many they're so frequent a lot of them can kind of fly under the radar unless they are really massive well i mean one of the primary functions of government is the safety of its people and cyber um, cyber attacks are now becoming one of the more prevalent ways in which um, individuals governments are, are are being attacked and i i believe that uh, you know, to Kieran's point, uh, it's not just uh, in the EU or in Ireland that they're behind the curve. We see that uh, in the U.S. And cyber warriors, which is a new term I, I've, right. I've learned, uh, the cyber warriors are increasing daily as we're trying to play catch up. And so much of what government does touches the public. Um, in, in the United States, 75% uh, of the IT budget uh, that's spent by the federal government is used to uh, b basically, you know, look at legacy systems and how to keep them up to date. But it's not dedicated to dealing with this issue of, of, of cybersecurity. Well, it's part of the problem, you know, the cost, right? If you've got, you, it's more than just updating to the latest software that you're sent from wherever you're getting it from. It's also, if you're a government and you're a health service or whatever, you have public, you have a bespoke services sometimes. And so it's more than just updating the software. You might also have to update the hardware so it's all compatible. And to me, it just seems like when we face local government cuts, all over the developed world, how do you face, how do you kind of measure up budgeting for cyber attacks? Is it that it's too low on the list of priorities? Well, it, I mean, f funding is a priority in general, but there's also such, a, such an interface between the federal or national government and, and local government, and there's so much of an overlap. And then there's even cross-border issues. I mean, you have cross-border issues in the EU, but even in North America, uh, when the Canadians are hacked, that could actually impact the United States. If you, if you just look at air traffic control, I mean, w w we share a lot of those services. So uh, it's something that requires the attention uh, of our policymakers at all levels of government. Um, when President Trump took office, that was one of the initial things he did when he signed uh, an executive order, forming a, a, a group led by uh, former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani and um, one of his advisors to actually look at where are we in terms of IT, cybersecurity uh, in the US government. We're still waiting to see what that committee has come forth with and what their recommendations are, but it clearly is something that needs to be a priority. So where are we? You know, we, I mentioned the UK's National Security Cybersecurity Center, but where, what support is already out there for public services trying to, trying to deal with this? You maybe, Karen? I, I, I I think we're, we're way behind, in my honest opinion. I mean, I, I would think that local authorities need to work closely, closer with tech companies in their local area. Um, it is amazing. I mean, I come, I come from a city, Cork, where Apple have their EU headquarters, and they, they give work to a thousand people, but they generally don't work with local councils to explore how can we actually improve your technologies and so on. How do how can we actually advance security training? Um, I think within local and regional authorities, security training, IT security training needs to be part of lo local and regional development plans. If it's not within a development plan, no funding is actually going to be allocated to it. So need, there needs to be a lot more awareness um, to go out there. And awareness that could mean that um, someone here is developing, um, uh, I suppose, um, security training or has, has, ha has something to offer to approach your local and regional authority and actually say, look, this is what I have to offer. Um, I know within my own local and regional authority, and I can probably I can speak as well for probably the rest of the, of the 95,000 local and regional authorities across the EU, they've got small IT administration units and they just need a lot more advanced security training, they really do. Um, 
and, and training of their employees. Um, and I, we, we, we are not taking it seriously enough. Um, and it, it should be, we should be taking it a lot more seriously. I, I think that there's a lot of efforts underway. The, pr the challenge is, is that uh, on the other side, uh, these cyber warriors are, are moving so fast, getting so clever, that uh, our public entities aren't able to, to keep up with it. I, I mentioned what, what's happening at the federal government at the executive level. We, we have a, a Computer uh, Abuse Act that, that has been in law for 30 years, has never been updated. So Congress is now starting to look at it. Our, our governors uh, have formed a compact and have created these fusion centers where they're sharing information. Our local governments are tying into that. They are working with the private sector. The problem is this is moving so fast. And part of the problem, I guess, is that when you talked earlier, Kieran, about kind of smart cities, this idea and this keenness to digitalize everything, right? You are, as citizens, you want to be able to do everything online, whether it's paying our taxes, whether it's registering for doctors. You, wanna, you want your government to be online and easily accessible. But a lot of these things are almost happening and security is being left as an afterthought. So it's, we create these systems, how should we protect them? Is there enough being done to consider how is security involved right from the start of the process so it's not a case of these organizations constantly responding to attacks and trying to kind of patch up holes i think at this moment in time it's just pa it is a patchwork situation and it needs to be more than that as you said it, as you said it needs to be something that we need to do from the very um beginning there, there's a lot of positivity around um smart specialization and um, creating i capital cities i cities um using machine red data um but we're not doing enough to, to build in the security elements of it. That's my, my own personal perspective. And I, and I suppose I, I'm lucky with the Euro European Committee of the Regions. I get to travel a lot right across the EU. I get to, in a sense, parachute into different cities and towns, and everyone's actually having the same kind of problem. Um, and I agree with Eric's point. It's, it's moving too slowly. Uh, and I, we might catch up with this in a year and a half from now. But the cyber, the cyber um, attackers have moved on to something else, um, and that, that, that their technology is also kind of advancing. Um, so I'm not, I, I just think we, it, it also with local and regional authorities, we're also bound to the thinking of um, central governments, national kind of governments. So if, you, if you've got a national government that's, um, that's taking it seriously, it will trickle down to local and regional government as well. So there are, we, we all need to take responsibility actually for it. And if I could just add, too, you know, it actually gets to the core of our democracy in some cases. Uh, there's a movement towards um, using computer technology for voting. Mm -hmm. uh, that could very easily be hacked. And there are examples uh, in the United States where people are questioning the validity of the voting system. And if you start getting cyber attacks on the voting system, then, then, you're, then you're really getting to the core of government. Well, I think that's also an issue is that when it happens on a voting system, everyone's very quick to consider that to be a very serious attack, a very serious breach. But what about when it happens when you have leaks of documents and information in the run-up to elections, which we saw in the US, which we saw in France, and those can also have a sway, but they're not seen to be in this direct threat on the election as it stands. It's, supposed, it's seen as kind of a sideways angle, but that can have just as much impact is part of the problem that how do governments decide where they should be retaliating to a lot of these attacks? What, is, what are the efforts that are happening in deterrence? As much as it's on public services to try and protect themselves, to ensure that security is built in, etc., there also needs to be some deterrence to cyber attacks as well. Well, I think the government paying attention to where these cyber attacks are coming from so people are vigilant and are looking out for it. Um, you know, we've, we've seen uh, our Department of Homeland Security uh, issue, uh, you know, reports or to uh, local governments, state governments looking out for um, attacks that could be waged on critical infrastructure. Um, and, and even some of the things you're talking about that have, you know, alleged to have impacted uh, the election. I think all those things need to be looked at. But beyond looking at them when it comes to deciding what should we respond to? How do we encourage um, 
less attacks. Is that, do we think maybe too narrowly about what counts as a kind of a serious security beat? And well, I, I think you have to look at it all. I think yeah. you have to look at the impact it's going to have on services that government provides, but I think you also need to look at how it's going to affect society as a whole. Uh, I just think, as I said before, not to sound redundant, that it's happening so fast that I think that our political leaders are not able to keep up with uh, the incoming fire. I, I do think as well that the, I suppose the general data protection regulations that are actually coming in from the European Union will actually help speed up some of the process. Um, like for example, as a, as a local councillor, local government councillor in Ireland, if, if I have a list of people, uh, constituents, I now have to declare if I've got a list of names, addresses, uh, and other kind of data. And, and I, I think that will actually build a lot more awareness as well um, right across the European Union in terms of we, we, we need to take this actually serious. Um, so I think that, that that's one kind of positive step. Um, and I know as well there are, um, the EU Commission has a fantastic e-government service and they've actually been doing a lot of these knowledge exchange kind of platforms and they've been moving slowly but surely from, we say, the benefits of data provision to cyber security. It's, it's all happening too slowly, but the wheel is moving. Well, as um, we think forward to all the ways we want to digitize our economies, what are some of the problems with the fact that security isn't keeping up? Because they imagine once you start eroding public confidence in a lot of services that are heavily reliant on, on technology, that you can start to undermine some of our hope for the future. I know one of the things you're interested in, Eric, is autonom um, autonomous vehicles and being able to have self-driving cars, which has been a huge part of today's discussion. But if people start thinking, all oh, this is connected to the internet, I like my, the other day my credit card details were stolen, do I want to get in this car? I mean, oh. Right, it's going, it's going to erode people's confidence. And we have all of these uh, tremendous technologies that are on the horizon, or some that are already rolled out or, or being piloted uh, or about to be rolled out. And uh, if we erode public confidence in, in how we're able to provide security, and autonomous vehicles is a, is a, is a great example. Uh, you know, we have traffic lights that are being put in that are going to be able to talk to cars. Cars are going to be able to talk to cars. If, if we're able to have hackers come in uh, and, and, and enter that system, that's going to erode the people's confidence and they won't use it. I do think that one of the challenges is that public officials, and this is a broad statement, uh, they don't all come to the table with a deep background in technology. So I do think it does require the private sector and, and uh, people that are involved in the IT world and the cybersecurity world uh, to work closely with political officials so that these, new, these officials, when they do get elected, they have a resource that they can turn to. Because otherwise, they're, they're just not knowledgeable enough to address the yeah. issues. Oh, precisely, I want to think about private companies in this role because so much of government services are privatized along the way. And so it's not just about governments responding to attacks on public services, it's about responding to attacks on private companies and very big private companies. Um, I mean, is there enough, what is the cooperation like there? I think I said at the start, between tech companies and local and regional government, very limited. <laughs> that's, 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 that's calling it. I, as I said, I, I come from a city with an Apple EU headquarters and they give fantastic employment. But, but outside of that, apart from their Apple developing their own kind of products and doing their own work, our, our regional tech systems aren't advanced. Um, and also within the, I suppose, within the EU and this kind of provision rollout of e-government services, I mean, they're trying to champion like things like the once-only principle, interoperability, cross-border. Um, if we can't look after the small stuff, there's no way we can actually do the big stuff. Um, and, and the big stuff is actually really kind of really exciting and, and very positive as well, if we can do a lot more cross-border. Um, so we need to look after the small stuff. Um, I mean, there, there are a lot of people out there that are worried about trying to get 2G broadband, no mind having broadband like 4 or 5G, or 5G, 6G of the future. So people are very skeptical, skeptical of the internet, uh, internet at the moment. Sometimes it, it doesn't work, the broadband doesn't work. So they're like, oh, the company is just taking my money and not actually giving me a facility. Um, but I think everyone is seeing all these phishing emails that are coming in, kind of looking for money. And, and people are, I think people are a lot more aware of that's a scam, that's a scam, that's a scam. Um, but I, I just think we need even more awareness of that again, especially people who are running local and regional authorities. 
Um, I might have time for an audience question if anyone has one, but I just have one final question for you guys, which is quite often when we have these leaks and these data breaches, it's often considered an embarrassment to the company, the public service, and we're still letting it happen to them. But is there enough focus on who is responsible for these attacks? Why are they happening? What are their goals with them? You know, where does this go in the future? As opposed to just constantly going, oh, can't believe the NHS didn't have the right security. Yes, that's bad, but what about who did this? Right, well, the immediate reaction is going to be, how did this affect me? Uh, and so that's why the attention is all paid for, you know, what, what is the effect of that particular breach? But I have to believe that law enforcement officials, whether it's at the federal state level in the United States uh, or working globally, uh, are working to try and track down as best they can. But again, that's where the sophistication of these cyber warriors um, is tough. And uh, it takes a long time. So the immediate thing you focus on is, how did that breach affect me? Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Kiri Narek before we wrap up? Does mine? Oh. Would you like to comment on how far you think it's a system problem rather than individual behavior problem? I, I think it's a mixture of different things. I mean, I, I suppose researching some cyber, cyber, cyber security for the data opinion I did, I mean, it was identified that in local councils there is weak software. I mean, as a local councillor, I'm actually not asked to change my password at all. Like in the Committee of the Regions, I'm asked to change my password. Um, and in the Irish context, it was actually someone hacked the, the email of a CE and actually then actually s took his identity and sent an email to, to, to send money to China. Now you could go, That's, that, that is complete human error and someone could have checked it. But it's, but it's a mixture of things like someone hacked the soft, the, the soft hardware of, of a council and then actually sent on a message. So it is, I think it's different things, not just kind of one thing. But there is a lot of human error out there. I think that there are systemic errors. I mean, the fact that the United States spends just under $100 billion on IT spend, and $75 billion of that is going just to monitor legacy systems, we've got a problem. It should be the majority of the funds is looking more forward thinking as how do we enhance and improve our legacy systems. Anyone else? Um, if that's all the questions, I think we're done. I thank you very much, Eric and Kieran, and uh, thank you all for joining us, and have a great afternoon.